Hello, this is David Opadal from the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you some information on the economic outlook for the food service industry. And we have a few um, interesting things to learn in terms of the Federal Reserve as well. So let's get started. The views expressed in this presentation are my own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago or the Federal Reserve System. And here you can see the system and the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C. oversees the 12 regional districts, including Chicago, which is District 7, and the five states around us, including Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Iowa is the only state we have the entirety of in our district. So a lot of agricultural production, a lot of food service jobs in this region. So it's a, a key area for our um, regional economy as well as the national economy. And I just wanted to start off a little bit of setting up where we are today by looking back a year ago and we started off in last March with the increase in COVID cases that we thought was pretty dramatic. And at the time it was um, very challenging for the US economy as we saw a deep downturn as the economy needed to slow down and in most cases even stop in order to allow us to um, fight the COVID pandemic. And eventually we saw a second and third wave of uh, the cases, as you can see in this chart, that reached a very high level over January of this year. And then finally, thankfully, we've seen that come down pretty dramatically in February and March. And now into April, there's been kind of a leveling off as we have at this um, level that's still too high, um, but at the same time is something more manageable. And as we go ahead, it looks like vaccinations are going to be able to ramp up dramatically and help to um, get the population so that the COVID cases will stay low. And so that's where we're at in terms of the pandemic and it has affected the economy in many ways and in many sectors. One of them is in particular um, is the food service sector. And so we'll talk about that a little more, but first I'd like to kind of set the stage by thinking about the National Activity Index that the Chicago Fed puts out, which is similar to taking your pulse. So this is kind of the pulse of the economy. Anything above zero indicates above trend growth. Anything below zero indicates below trend growth. And here you can see from this um, three month average of the um, index, which covers you know around 100 um, different data sources within the economy. So covers a lot of the economy and gives us kind of a summary statistic in one um, measure. So in the current downturn, we saw deep, deep drops that were much larger than even the Great Recession of um, 2008 and 9. And then we saw a very rapid recovery in terms of growth already occurring last summer and moving up at a very high level um, as reopenings occurred during that time. And then since that period, it's kind of tapered off and only had about trend growth, which is around 2% for the US economy and the gross domestic product. So, um, you know, kind of weaker growth by the end of the year in 2020, but hopefully this first quarter of 2021 um, came out of the gates um, a little stronger than that. There does seem to be evidence of that, even though there were some challenges in the first quarter of 2021. Still, you know, it's such a traumatic time for the U.S. economy with lots of jobs lost during this period. And then the recovery has been um, relatively um, less um, strong than we would have liked, although maybe um, has been a little faster than some had anticipated. And here's one example of how deep the challenges we're facing ha have been. If you look here at the percent change in the number of small business um, establishments that are open, um, you know, in particular, the hospitality and the leisure and food service sectors um, in the bottom line, you know, it, the drops were about half 
and we're still you know down at that same kind of level about you know a cut in half of the number of uh, establishments because um, you know it's been a continuing and a long-term phenomenon over the last year and it challenges um, these companies to stay open even though you can see there have been a number of programs that have been instituted from the PPP loans and their forgiveness um, through all the different kinds of um, stimulus efforts that were put through the federal by the federal government and local and state governments as well. So it's still a challenging period. Um, lots of small businesses have closed, and then along with that, lots of jobs were lost. And looking at specifically the food economy, the disruptions have been quite severe with food distribution networks um, having to deal with many logistical challenges and the loss of demand for food services, including schools. Um, these were issues that um, led to the problems in getting the food products to the right people at the right places. And it was um, especially severe for the dairy sector. So milk got dumped because you couldn't um, get it into the right kind of containers after the food services didn't need it and there wasn't a place for it to go and it's a perishable product. Um, you know, the grocery cells were emptying out, but the milk could not fill it fast enough. And so it was a very big challenge for the food production sectors. Um, you know, they were hurt by COVID cases as well when you had meat packing plants that were shut down. And this all led to a jump in food eaten at home, as well as an increase in food prices. The, um, you know, the switch in consumer behavior was pretty dramatic as the cases of COVID were spiking. People you know, followed the guidance and you know, they needed to eat at home. And then food takeout and delivery began to um, really pick up, but at the same time, that wasn't necessarily the same food service establishments that had um, lost their, their customers. And so many restaurants had to close. And it was a period where the unemployment rate in food services was up about 30% from February and March, April last year. Um, and then the food processing sector unemployment um, rose about 4.4%. And on the other hand, food production itself um, unemployment dropped 1.4 percentage points. So it was definitely um, a pandemic recession that led to um, various outcomes. And if you looked at delivery services, those had a big increase in, in their employment as well. So that was the initial stage that was very challenging. The additional stages from May to August, you know, we had continued declines in, um, you know, the ability of people to get out in some cases, um, but then other parts of the economy were opening up. And so there was kind of a dual effect. And as the rest of the economy started to open up more, unemployment and food services dropped 13.5 percentage points, food processing minus 4.4 percentage points, and then food production also had unemployment dropping. So employment came back, but at the same time, um, it was um, not always the same people in those jobs, and there was a lot of um, disruption in many of these businesses, which tend to be small. And then after the 50% increase in groceries and um, spending on the various kinds of um, food services that, you know, people could get at home, those, you know, are transitions that are going to continue. and when you think about the consumer over the next um, you know, period of time, they're having to adjust their expectations and their um, behaviors because they've gone through this period where they couldn't go out and eat at restaurants. And they maybe, as the slide on the right side shows, um, got interested in cooking at home. So cookbooks were a hot item in 2020 and the pandemic um, kitchen um, led to things like baking and runs on flour. And at the same time that that was happening, you had a lot of snacking going on and companies like ConAgra, as the headline shows, bet on new consumer behaviors that might outlast the pandemic. Um, 
you know, watching a movie at home instead of in the theater and making your own popcorn is something that may be with us for a while as people adjusted and upgraded their home um, theater systems. So a lot of um, changes that have happened over the last year um, have led to some permanent and, you know, maybe some temporary changes over time. But online shopping is likely here to stay. I think local food has seen a boost that's probably going to continue. Um, and then, of course, food safety is something that um, everyone has on my, their minds. So as all this was happening in the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve System had to take action because of our dual mandate that we want to um, both support full employment and um, moderate price increases. We had to act quickly given the, dro the drops in employment and the major problems that the economy was experiencing as it entered a recession a year ago. And this chart shows how the Fed funds rate target, the primary tool in most periods for the U.S. economy, has um, had to you know, decline pretty dramatically again, and it's been close to zero um, all this last year, um, which is similar to what happened in the last recession. That, um, But there we had started at a higher level in terms of the interest rates coming into the recession, and then um, they had to stay low for a longer period of time than we would have expected normally, um, as they were bounded by zero and as interest rates dropped, additional stimulus was needed in, for the monetary supply. And so that led to what many have seen as quantitative easing or um, asset purchases by the Fed. And you can see that back in the 2008-2009 timeframe, we had some big increases in our balance sheet for special programs during the financial crisis at that time. But then over the next few years, um, there were additional increases in our balance sheet. Um, eventually, it got over $4 trillion in 2015 as the recovery was slower than anticipated. And so um, there was stimulus that continued through that period. But then now in this current period, we've seen the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve System increase even more dramatically. Um, it was increased very quickly in the early parts of the pandemic, and it ended up over $7 trillion and rising towards $8 trillion here. So you can see that it's been a very challenging um, experience for not only the U.S. economy, but then the stimulus side that, you know, in terms of monetary stimulus here, um, it's helped to um, keep from having any major financial meltdown this time. Um, so quite a different recession than the Great Recession where there was, you know, the problems with the um, housing sector leading into that recession. And right now, um, the housing sector is one of the hot parts of this um, economy. So that's something different as well. And just in terms of some financial um, aspects of this um, period, you can see that we did have a flight to quality in terms of a spread between corporate high yield securities and corporate AAA, more safe securities. And that spiked in the start of the pandemic, but came down fairly rapidly and now is actually under the level it was prior to the uh, pandemic. So there seems to be some you know, moderation in terms of people's um, worries about the financial side of the pandemic recession. And right now that's um, reassuring at the, the other side of the finance. Um, you know, we can think about record stock prices and how they've risen um, up out of the ashes pretty quickly. They were, they had dropped quite dramatically along with the economy last spring. And now they've risen well above their previous peaks. Here you can see they're adjusted for inflation. So. Um, very interesting to see how the financial side has not been as um, dramatically affected as the um, real side of the economy. And here also the housing market is starting to heat up again. Um, it, you know, last spring um, also took a downturn, but it recovered fairly quickly. And now things like 
homes are in high demand. You have a lot of people that wanted to move out of cities into the suburban areas or rural areas. And so there, there is demand in much of the country for new homes. And so the home builders have responded and picked up their housing starts again. And things like lumber are, um, you know, seeing high, high increases in costs. So it's been a challenging time for housing starts, even, um, you know, when you have such a big spurt in growth, it can lead to its own challenges. And one of those is the labor side, that there's just not enough workers to help build all the homes that people would like to buy. And in real estate, um, you know, there's just not enough inventory available for uh, home buyers to look at. And if you're gonna make an offer, you better do it fast because in certain markets, in certain locations in particular, there's multiple um, people looking to buy those homes and are bidding up the prices in many cases. So um, it's on the right side, you can see that the home mortgage rates are very low right now, um, not quite as low as they were during some times in the last year, but still, um, at levels that are making it more affordable pe for people to um, buy their homes. And at the same time, it, the bidding wars are kind of working against that. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see how things shake out um, with these hot kinds of um, housing markets. And over time, um, you know, hopefully there'll be enough building. You know, you can see on the left that we're only up to kind of the levels um, that were more normal prior to the big housing boom we had. And then we had the bus that took us um, well below the levels that we would normally have had coming out of a recession. So here we are in a hot market with um, you know pretty big increases in home prices. Another area that's been pretty strong has been the manufacturing sector. And this is reflected in the manager's Purchasing Managers Composite Index for both the nation and for Chicago. There, anything above 50 indicates expansion in the manufacturing sector. And right now we're at some of the higher levels that we've seen, including I think a record for the nation. So it's a challenge for them in terms of having so much business return that it's, uh, you know, we're seeing logistical challenges. We're seeing um, problems with having the kinds of materials you need, raw material prices are up and there's some shortages of things like steel. And so it's a, a big um, increase in, in industrial output. Here you can see that there was a bit of a downturn in February because of the weather issues in, around the country, especially down in the South. And so energy uh, production was cut back. And so there was a dip, but at the same time, we're getting close to the pre-pandemic levels for manufacturing output, and there should be a bounce back from that that we'll see when the numbers come out for March. So it's a pretty um, you know, important sector for stimulating the economy. So it's, it's great to see the uh, manufacturing sector moving forward. One of the key parts of the manufacturing sector for our district in particular is the light vehicle uh, production and here you can see that total light vehicle um, units were rising up towards the levels that we're seeing prior to the pandemic but not quite there yet for um, total light vehicles um, or for passenger cars where the trend is against them but for light trucks we're pretty much up to that level and still there aren't enough available uh, for certain models in particular so the manufacturers of light trucks are facing um, tight inventories that they, you know, and we're seeing um, microchips in particular be something that, you know, are just in tight supply and then um, they can't produce the vehicles as quickly as they would like um, because of not having enough of them. So the auto sector's on its way towards, um, you know, healthy numbers for this year, but constrained a little bit because of those um, logistical issues. and. Um, that's something that hopefully will be ironed out towards um, the summer and towards the fall. And when you think about employment, that's a, a key indicator for the U.S. economy. And here you can see how um, employment dropped so dramatically from a year ago in the United States. 
uh, and for the Midwest, and it just um, was down over 15% at one point, but then it came back to be about 5% down for the year. Um, so, you know, still a very significant decrease, which, you know, that's about as far down as it, um, employment drop was in the Great Recession last time, and that's about where we were by the end of the year. So still a long ways to go on the employment side of the recovery. It's a challenging time that we've seen, um, you know, a lot of issues with various um, groups in the economy and some such as those that work in the food service sector have seen um, greater unemployment and job losses than other parts. So here you can see the overall unemployment rate has um, been coming down now to 6% for the United States in March. At the same time, the Midwest has recovered a little bit more quick than that, but you know, way down from the um, peak and then, you know, much lower than we were at the same period of the Great Recession and recovery there. So, um, you know, that's kind of how you would expect it to be in this type of an economy where you had such a deep drop from a reason other than an economic one. Um, you know, as we started to reopen the economy last year, a lot of people came to back to work quickly and programs such as the PPP and others helped many companies to maintain their job levels higher than they otherwise would have been. So one of the things that's happened more recently now is that the unemployment insurance claims have actually fallen below the previous record that we had seen almost 700,000. And so we had one um, week below that after having 52 weeks above it, so a full year of you know, of the unemployment insurance claims being higher than they ever had been before. And as you can see from this chart, the average in 2019 was only a little over 200,000. So a big increase um, in terms of the claims. And of course, those have been um, continued longer maybe than they otherwise would have in terms of the government support through some of the stimulus packages that have provided additional weeks of benefits. So. It's uh, a period that we've seen some improvement now. We're down from those very high levels of a year ago, but still a um, long ways to go before we get close to the levels that are more normal, especially um, those of 2019. And another aspect of employment that is still challenged is the full-time employment versus part-time. Here you can see the red line indicates full-time employment is still well down um, from where it had been, about 125 million jobs, whereas it was um, getting close to 135 million jobs before the recession. And overall, um, you know, some of the more recent um, recovery has been part-time jobs. So we'd hope that those jobs would be switching toward full-time jobs and people would be able to find additional full-time work in the near future, even though um, some of the recovery has um, focused on the part-time jobs that are um, more available now, and hopefully that will be switching soon, as there's a, you know a challenging time for many of those workers still, and for those that just kind of dropped out of the workforce because of the health issues and their concerns over whether they would be safe um, when they were at work. So um, there should be able to be some additional workforce entering now that vaccinations are becoming more commonplace and available. One of the parts of the um, labor market that's been doing well is the manufacturing, and that's something that is leading to higher wages for workers. Here you can see that real average hourly earnings had um, been moving up around 2% over the last year now. So relatively strong increases in income uh, for workers as they're needing, you know, as companies need to hire additional workers and they can't find them, they're raising wages and then that's helping to um, move up wages for others that are already in the job. So it's um, been a period where we've started to see some of that pressure for wages and that could possibly move into um, broader parts of the economy, although we haven't seen that yet. Uh, when you look at prices side of things, um, the other part of our dual mandate 
that you can see here that oil prices have dropped sharply in the early parts of the recession, but then they've returned more recently as we've started to see people driving again after they had to stay at home. And so the oil usage is up, but then um, there was also a constraint on the supply side that you know a lot of um, production slowed. And so now some of that's coming back as well. So um, that should help to keep oil prices from rising as dramatically as they did in the earlier um, recession um, in 2008 and nine, but then we didn't get stuck down at lower levels as long either. So there's a lot of volatility in energy prices um, and they're rising again now. When you think about other increases in prices, food prices have risen over what are they, where they were a year ago, about 4% during parts of the recession, a little under that now, as you can see here. So a lot of volatility there as well when you see some of the earlier periods, um, ups and downs for food prices, moving around the core um, price level, which takes out food and energy and everything else in the economy is included in the core. This is the consumer price index. So it's one measure that um, accounts for you know, lots of different um, activity in a basket of consumer purchases. And right now, um, we haven't seen a big increase in the overall level of um, the inflation pressures. Um, core is still well below 2% and hasn't been rising yet. So that's something that is um, at the back of the minds of the Federal Reserve that um, we do anticipate some increase in prices now. And that's something that um, would be appropriate under you know, these kinds of economic conditions to see to help kind of balance out the lower prices we've seen before. One other um, key component of the U.S. economy is the exports and imports through international markets. There, there's been a little boost this year because of the drop in the past year over um, after an increase at the very beginning of the pandemic in the value of the dollar. It's been down now um, quite a bit from the spike that was seen, and it's supportive of additional exports of agricultural products and many other products. Here you can see that exports and imports were both down last year. And so it, the international trade was hurt and now it continues to be challenged by many factors, including um, logistics issues and unloading and uploading new ships. Um, and then they get one stuck in the Suez Canal and that makes it even harder for some of the transportation sector. So it's a, it's a challenging time, but hopefully there will be a pickup in both imports and exports that will help boost um, trade in the U.S. economy. And then when you think about agriculture and its role in international trade, um, it's one of the areas that actually has a trade surplus for the United States. And so exports have been um, outrunning imports for a long time, and that's been very helpful, although they narrowed in the last few years, but then now the anticipation from the USDA forecast is that there'll be increase um, and widen a little bit this year as we have started to see a big comeback in the purchases of agricultural products by China. So that dropped off in the last five years, but then has bounced back the last couple of years as we had uh, agreements for some of the trade products there. and. The Chinese just needed to feed their own people, and so there were some issues with their hog production and um, other um, ability to be able to buy enough products and, and internally produce them. So um, they've had to, um, you know, turn to trade, and so that's been very helpful for our agricultural trade balance. And I anticipate that that would be continuing to help boost our Midwestern producers. And in in fact, we do see this in terms of farmland values. This is just one indicator of the health of agriculture. And here you can see that you know, in the previous six years, there had been lagging farmland values. And then finally in 2020, they bounced up around um, 6% from a year ago. So fairly strong um, recovery after a long period of down um, time for 
you know, the farm incomes and then just um, needing to um, recover from some of the, you know, rapid increases that had occurred prior to that. So a uh, challenging time for agriculture a year ago turned out to end up in a fairly good year with higher prices for corn and soybeans and many other products, although some like the dairy sector saw a lot more volatility than others. And yet and, um, the government supported in many ways as well, and that helped uh, boost farmland values as, in addition. So where do we see the economy going? The Federal Open Market Committee, um, each member puts out a forecast um, four times a year, and the most recent one from March shows that, you know, and I guess the way to think about this is the red bar indicates kind of the center of that forecast, where the majority of the participants viewed things going. And, um, and for this year, 2021, you can see that the um, view on inflation is that it'll be up over 2%, up around 2.5%, which would actually fall into the new kind of monetary um, thinking that uh, we want to try to average around 2%. We've been below that for several years, and now it would be appropriate to have inflation run a little faster than our target of 2%, and then um, that would help to keep the economy steady and stable and to promote economic growth in the long run. Now, the anticipation is that inflation will be falling the next couple of years, uh, or not falling, but lower in, towards that 2% um, target than in 2022 and 2023. At the same time that inflation would be up, the gross domestic product is going to be up a lot this year. Um, so that's the anticipation that there would be a boost to economic activity and the recovery um, up towards um, 6% or so. And that would really um, engender some of the higher increase in prices that we are thinking will occur. And so it's an important um, period that we would hopefully have already seen in the first quarter when the numbers come out later this month that there was this kind of a, a movement up in the economic growth after the um, worst of the pandemic is behind us. And in the next couple of years, then have economic growth be moving down towards the long-term trend, which is about 2%. Um, so still above trend growth for the next couple of years after this um, big um, jump this year as the recovery really kicks into gear. And then on unemployment, you know, we had the big increase in 2020, um, ended up over 6% for the year. And then now um, this year should be down closer to 4% and a little under that for the next couple of years as moving towards that longer term um, rate of around 4% for unemployment. So it's still um, a challenging period. Lots of um, you know, recovery and healing needs to happen for the economy, just like it does for individuals. Um, one of the things that is helping with that is the Fed funds rate target should remain low for the next few years. Here you can see the dot plot where each individual member of the Federal Open Market Committee um, has a dot representing their views on interest rates and um, all of them see interest rates staying low this year. And then next year and the year after just a handful show an increase. And so it's still gonna be a while before interest rates get up to that longer run trend of about two and a half percent. So relatively low um, short-term interest rates. Of course, long-term interest rates have been moving up some this year. And so that's you know, so, you know, leading to a little bit of a spread there, but still not um, you know, moving up that rapidly. In summary then, it looks like the US economy is going to expand at a pace above trend for the next few years after the big drop off last year and employment is going to continue rising with the hope that um, unemployment will get, you know, the rates there will get down below the levels of 4% and it'll help to heal, um, you know, the broad job market and as well as some of those you know, pockets where there were, a, you know, higher rates of unemployment even than what we saw overall. And housing and manufacturing are some of the sectors that are 
doing quite well and they're um, anticipated to continue growing. Um, agriculture had a strong 2020 in the end. It wasn't anticipated that it was gonna be um, such a good year, you know, when we started a year ago, but now that, um, you know, we've seen the government support continuing, um, that's something that'll help a little bit in the current year, but it won't be as big of uh, support as it was last year. So some um, challenges could come up, you know, some of the sectors of the food and um, economy are still being um, challenged as they have to deal with uh, how to reopen and whether some businesses are going to be able to reopen um, after having been closed for a long time. Um, and of course, nice weather now is helping around Chicago to let get people out and we can eat outside more easily again. So the winter's over and hopefully for the economy as well as for personal lives, we'll start to um, move back towards something a little more normal after um, you know, such a long year of um, having to deal with what's been um, coming through the pandemic and all the um, associated ways in which we try to um, keep people from getting um, sick. And so hopefully um, this coming year, we'll see a revival in the food sector in particular. And that's something that I think it's poised to happen, but it's just gonna take time and um, there will be new trends. There will be changes in behavior of consumers that have to be accounted for. But I think overall that it's, it's a period that might be um, healthy in the sense that um, you know, people are coming back in eating in new ways, and they've been exposed to some additional, um, you know, techniques in cooking. And so there's a lot of um, activity and a lot of interest in food, and that's a positive for the sector.